papers and pencils on the uh, round tables for our members. And I believe I've already gotten some uh, questions uh, from the public. So we will be, so we have such a large crowd, we will giving, be giving our members priority and answering the questions when we start the Q&A. But if we have time, we will answer questions from the public. Uh, I, um, our team, public policy team, if you've got a, a, I mean a, a question, raise your hand, somebody will collect it, they will give it to me, I will uh, screen the questions and then give them to Catherine. That will be happening hopefully around 20 till 12. So that's the uh, questions. Uh, we are being videoed. So this uh, recording will be posted on our website. Uh, so for Members that were not here, that you know, tell them it will be on our website, and the public, you can go to our website. Hmm. I think that's it. So I'm going to introduce Catherine Lutz, my co-president, and she is going to be the moderator today, and she will introduce our panel members. And the, the, the panel here uh, are the newly elected. I think this was some confusion also. Why weren't all... The uh, the counselors here. Um, our our um, topic for our January meeting was to hear from the newly elected, and these three people were invited in November as the newly elected uh, counselors. So, Catherine, you want to come up? It is great to see everybody here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And thank you three for being here. Tanya, I'm so glad you made it. Woo! Okay. I'm going to put my owl glasses on. I'm going to read very abridged versions of bios. So, just know that I, that I know. Very abridged. Okay, my first one is Bob Kaplan. I live in Ashland with my wife, Lori. Uh, before moving to Ashland, I spent three decades working in Latin America and the Caribbean on economic and community development and environmental policies and programs, including over six years as president of the Inter-American Foundation and 16 years as an executive at the Inter-American Development Bank. In addition to serving on the Co-ops Finance Committee, now he's back in Ashland, and before that, the AFC Gives Committee. I also serve on the City of Ashland's Climate Policy Commission mm -hmm. and Citizens Budget Committee, the Board of Aura, and Semilla Nueva means new seed, a nonprofit organization dedicated to eliminating micronutrient malnutrition in Guatemala. I also volunteered with UNITE, and each winter and spring finds me reading <laughs> over 60 new play scripts for the Ashland New Plays Festival. <laughs> All right, so that's, that's Bob. <laughs> so, here you go, Eric. I was 18 when I moved to Ashland to attend the university. It was love at first sight. <laughs> Ashland's proximity to wildlands makes it an ideal community for hiking, riding bikes, skiing, and our close-knit community and great schools makes Ashland an ideal place for raising children. I've lived here for 30 years. I've created a business here, Truth South Solar, that has installed hundreds of renewable projects here in Ashland. We're celebrating 12 years of success. We started with three, we now have 22 employees. I've built a house, I've raised a family, my kids are in school here. We're on mountain bike teams and volunteer in the community. So that's Eric. Mm -hmm. Tanya, you're in your summer, there you are. <laughs> Okay, for Tanya, Ashland has been my home for over 20 years and is now my second hometown. I've raised my children here because of its safe environment, natural beauty, dedication to its children, and its eclectic mix of small town and nationally renowned theater, art, and music. Ashland's an incredible place to live, work, raise a family, and retire, and I can speak to that as a retiree. I've spent my professional life working to address ecological and climate challenges, starting from a place of collaboration, and aiming for a win-win solution wherever possible. I'm the executive director of the GEOS Institute, where much of my work focuses on helping communities build climate resilience. This work has taught me that it's nearly impossible to separate environmental issues from other community issues. 
It's also taught me how to engage a community to help it create integrated holistic solutions to some of its most difficult challenges. A skill that's increasingly important as Ashland works to address local issues such as housing crisis, homelessness, economic disruption, and climate change, all of which you'll see represented in our questions. So give a hand to our Again, thank you all for being here. So first question. Um, this is going to be for both Bob and Eric and Tanya. I have a separate one for you, okay? Guess what? Uh, this week, the mayor and the city council <laughs> have both resigned with limited explanations. What's going on, in your opinion? And how will the city leadership get back on track? So Eric, you want to start? <laughs> It's going to be an easy one to start off with. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, thank you all for coming and inviting us here. This is lovely. And after years of, of COVID and you know attempts to communicate, not in person, isn't it nice to all be together? Yay! So thank you for coming. And this is a great start to the year. Wow. Um, I'm a new counselor, and I'm going to try not to step in it. Um, and I, I'm not... Uh, in personal relations with the mayor or Councillor Moran, so I will take their statements at face value and give you um, what I've seen from really intimately following council for the last six months, going to every meeting and um, public participation in that way. I believe that the mayor and Councillor Moran stated that uh, when you know it's time, it's time. And, and Councilor Moran stated that his, uh, his, his efforts um, are somewhat ineffective uh, in the new council. And I'm paraphrasing, and I, I apologize for that, not quoting exactly, but um, from where I've, I've sat and observed, uh, there have been um, efforts by former mayor and former councilor that were leading to something that was challenged in the results of the election, and they have quit, they have resigned, and they are uh, no longer pursuing those efforts. That's all I can really say. I, I think as a new counselor, um, the first couple meetings were exciting, and we worked together well, and I, I appreciate their service. I know it's been hard during COVID times, but onward and upward. Thank you, Eric. You know, one of the things I forgot to mention is that I'm going to give you guys each two minutes to answer, okay? Yeah, and I didn't tell you that. So, um, Leslie right here is our timekeeper, and she's going to hold up cards for you. So, Great. just keep an eye on that, as will I. Okay, Bob, all yours. Well, and, and Eric said both voice today. Um, again, also really lovely to be here, and, and thanks so much to everybody for coming out. I think this is every time you know, we see have these opportunities to all gather together. It's just so great to see everybody just so happy to be together again. So that's really, sorry, that's exactly what we need, to put our mic right close to our mouth uh, and, uh, and, and really enjoy being together again to, to get out of the socially distancing and really come to the, you know, getting back together again and have, you know, um, uh, social approximation. Um, so, I don't really have too much to add uh, to what Eric said, other than uh, you all know that we've called a special uh, council meeting, that's for a special council meeting on Tuesday, and that's where we're going to discuss the process for filling uh, the vacancies that are now uh, in the mayor's position and then the, uh, the council position that's open. So um, that'll be discussed on, on Tuesday. Come, come join us at the meeting uh, or watch on TV. Learn more about what the process will be. We'll all learn more about the process because because we'll be talking about that. I'm um, I don't do not really know uh, Councilor Moran uh, very well. We interacted just very briefly, but I had you know a number of uh, uh, good uh, conversations and coffees and interactions with Mayor Aiken. So I'm, uh, we shared a lot of uh, common values, I think, and I'm uh, disappointed that. Um, that she uh, won't be uh, serving anymore on, on as, as mayor. Uh, I had an opportunity to see her in Railroad Park the other day, where she was uh, helping to put up the T-shirts again. Uh, and I, you know, we had a brief conversation there. And I wish her all the best. And I wish uh, Councillor Moran all the best as well. 
I thank them for their service to our community, and um, we'll try to carry the ball forward the next step of the way. Okay, thank you. Tanya, I've got a question for you. As interim Just mayor, can you explain the process going forward? How long will you serve as interim mayor? And when will a new mayor be elected? And how will your replacement as a councilor be handled? Okay, so um, first, thank you to the AAUW. Um, I know that I have benefited in my life from the work that you've done and the other chapters around the country have done. My daughters have benefited, but also my sons, because gender equity is about making all of us better. And so thank you so much for your work and for having us here today. Um, there's a couple of things, you know, it's not often that elected leaders, after going through all the trouble of running for office and being seated in a position, will resign suddenly. And it's certainly not common that it happened twice in two days. And so, you know, last week is a week that we are going to remember for a good while. It's, we, are, we are in a situation we wouldn't anticipate being in, and it's big and it's important. Um, what is also true is that we have procedures in place, and I think there's a little bit of confusion that I might try to, to, to sort out here for folks. So the mayor's position is vacant right now. We have a council chair, and the council chair's job is to step in whenever the mayor cannot perform their duties. And so that's what the council chair is doing right now. But we, we simply have a vacant mayor's position. We don't really have an interim mayor. Um, but the, all of that work will get done because of the procedures we have in place. And so as Bob mentioned, we are having a meeting on Tuesday to decide how to fill these because both of these positions will be appointed by the council, by vote of the council. For the mayor, there are two potential pathways. One is to appoint from within the council, or the other one is to uh, have an, an application process in the larger community and then appoint a resident. So we'll be working on figuring that out and then with the council, um, there will be a, 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 a process where we call for applications. Um, you know, I think that what's, what's important to keep in mind here is that we have procedures in place to handle these sorts of things. Yes, we have a transition that's in front of us, but um, we have excellent staff, we have highly skilled counselors, and, uh, and we will continue to govern. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. The city of Ashland has lost a lot of employees over the last year. That over 50 has been mentioned. Can you explain why you think employees are leaving and what suggestions would you have to retain employees? And so, Bob, I'll start with you. Well, thanks. Um, I think uh, we've lost a lot of employees in the city of Ashland. A lot of businesses have lost employees over the last uh, year or so. So I think it's not the same. It's part of the same trend, but it's also maybe also uh, due to some specific uh, factors here in, in Ashland. I think that um, you know there has been instability in leadership. We now have you know a couple of uh, uh, a mayor and a, and a councilor who stepped down as well. But I was speaking more about the leadership of the of the city, the department heads. We were actually missing four department heads. From my own experience managing uh, you know, groups of people, when, when there's uncertainty in the workplace, people start looking around a little bit about, well, where's a better place to go? If they're feeling a little bit left behind in terms of uh, cost of living and their salary is not going up as much, uh, Ashton City's staff salaries didn't go up uh, with cost of living until this past summer when the, when the council approved the cost of living increase. 4% uh, for this year with inflation running at, at 8%. So we, I think there's probably uh, reason to, to, to expect that staff also felt that they were falling a little bit behind uh, there as well. Um, so I think there's a, you know, a, number of, a number of factors. I think people are looking for different opportunities and, and trying to do what's best for their, for their family is, as well. I know that it's also hard at this time to recruit people, not just in Ashland, but also in, uh, in the broader <laughs> workplace. Um, I'm at the I'm on the board of the food co-op as you mentioned in my uh, uh, intro, and you know it's the same same thing. We're also <coughs> having difficulty recruiting people into, into that retail business uh, because people are looking at other opportunities as well. So I'm hoping that we can help our city manager to stabilize the situation. I'm, I'm uh, appreciative that the council approved uh, cost of living adjustments for uh, the staff going out three years. So there's a, a um, expectations and uh, I think we'll get back on track. Okay, Ms. Tanya, how about you go next? All right, 
great. <laughs> um, so this, the, the resignations have been happening for, for about two years, and, and as Bob mentioned, part of the difficulty was that we had several key staff leadership positions where people left in uh, 2021. And that has created some of that instability. There is the great resignation that is happening, that is real. It is happening particularly in local government, and, and Ashland seems to be bearing a, a particular um, burden in terms of all that. In November, or, in, or I guess a little bit earlier in the fall, we asked our staff to tell us what was coming from the exit interviews that they were doing. So we had a new city manager and deputy city manager come on at the beginning of last year, and in that process, we, we also lost our HR person in the spring, so they've been covering, but they've been asking people on their way out what's causing that, and they came back with four things for us. Um, instability in leadership, really around that administrative leadership of the city. Uh, seeing that turnover has made people feel inst unstable. Commuting costs, and that's really to that inflation question. Uh, budget cut rhetoric uh, that people were hearing in the community around significant extreme budget cuts were making people feel like they might need to preempt a layoff or uh, losing their job. And then uh, the last one was council rhetoric, that there was a, a perceived lack of support, appreciation, and trust for city staff and their professionalism. And one of the things that we're dealing with here in Ashland is just happening everywhere, and that is that you know we can't go to a, a local government conference without seeing a highlight of local civility. And so that's one of the things that we really need to be working on is making sure that the people who are doing good work for us feel supported. Doesn't mean we can't criticize the you know things that are happening and and, and question that, but it does mean that we need to be respectful of the people who are doing the work and providing the services. Eric, you're up. Well, thank you, Tanya and Bob. I mean, those are all the all the points, and I really appreciate the input from staff. It's been difficult at times the last two years to read the news and. Um, really digest the, the, the tone of the headlines. It's been very challenging, I'm sure, for staff. Um, you're, you're, you're spot on with, um, with those comments from, from staff, I think, that people want to really truly want to be appreciated in their work, and they want to be paid fairly, and they want to feel safe and secure. And I don't think that that environment has been nurtured this last couple of years. There's been a very aggressive challenge um, to competency of city workers, to competency of policy, and a real um, distrust of um, budget and spending. And, and from where I, I've, I've been taking this in as a citizen of Ashland, um, it's, it's been very exciting, and there's been lots of um, you know, passion around these topics but they haven't produced much, if anything, other than bad taste, distrust, alienation, and fear. So uh, I believe that civility is at the core of, of this, but also um, wages are real. And I believe that we can, we can do a wage study and we can see where we land and we can make efforts to get towards being a, a better provider of um, competitive wages, but also, people want to work at a place that's cool. And Ashland hasn't, hasn't been like warm and supportive and cool the last couple of years. So I really, I really thank everybody that's stuck with it and is here. And there's no magic, you know, new, you know, wipe and clean slate. We carry our history forward. And I hope that staff can continue to do the good work that they've been doing and um, continue to plug in. Uh, better communication is great to see, uh, both from the city and also from, from, from us, uh, from us Ashlanders, getting together and, and being here and asking questions and um, it seems to all be on the, the right path. All right, thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Okay, the public rejected measures 
that the city put on the November ballot to one, consolidate all city employees under the city manager, and two, to move the Parks Department budget into the general fund. So what was your position as a candidate and why? Now, as a city councilor, how do you see the city moving forward with managing the issues that these two measures were hoping to address? So Tanya, I'll start with you. Thank you. Um, so the, this conversation came up because we moved from a strong mayor form of government to a council manager form of government, and it brought forward again this question of who has authority and responsibility for different elements of the city. So that's what the, the, the overarching piece that we're grappling with in all of this. Um, the, the one thing to just clarify is that the second piece was really around where to put our food and beverage tax money. So did we want to bring, and it wasn't the 25% that already goes to the parks for capital improvements, but it was that other 76%, uh, 75%. Um, because what we had typically spent it on was no longer, um, we'd already paid off the wastewater debt and we changed how we were paying for streets. So what the, my position was to find out what the community wanted. So for our history, we have always kept parks separate. As we were coming into this question of how do we realign and, and get our operational system functioning under this council management form of government, the question for me was, Ashland people, do you want us to keep parks in this very separate special place that it has already always been in? And the answer that came back was yes. And there's good reason, there is, there's good reason for doing that in a general fund. Parks are always up against um, you know, fire department and police for funding and things, and so having people with just their eye on parks makes some sense in a community that loves its parks like we do. Going forward, we need to be working collaboratively with the Ashland Parks and Recreation Commission to figure out what is the best way, what it operationally, for us to do this the way the voters want and also um, be working within our, our new form of government. Thank you, Tonya. Uh, Bob Howard, if you go next. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I, I also uh, opposed, well, I don't know, also, I didn't say she opposed, I opposed both of those uh, measures, ballot measures, right from the beginning. I thought that there was really not much basis for even uh, going to the voters with those. I, I didn't think they were well prepared, drafted, uh, or discussed in, in the council. I didn't think that they really were addressing a problem that was clear. Uh, so that's why I came out, you know, early on and said that I was opposed to both of those measures. Um, I, I think that we have uh, a long-standing uh, structural uh, challenge that really has come to the fore with the budget um, tightness in the last few years. The history is that parks was uh, separate from, uh, from the management of the city for, for many years, funded with a separate uh, levy. Uh, and in the 90s, with the passage of the uh, state um, uh, property tax uh, uh, laws, um, it was, they were no longer able to, to use that separate levy. So there was a gentleman's agreement at the time. They said there was a, maybe there was a gentlewoman as well, I don't know, probably not. It was the 90s after all. Um, and uh, uh, they kind of muddled through and had the gentleman's agreement to just give the Parks uh, Commission the equivalent of what they had previously in, in property tax revenue. That worked fine until money got a little tighter. And once money got a little tighter, then started shrinking that, that pot of money and make it more difficult for parks to, to manage that. Uh, neither the uh, ballot initiative for the food beverage tax nor the uh, change of who the, the staff report to was really getting at that more fundamental problem. So I believe we as a community need to really decide uh, through a longer process, not just a one-off ballot measure, of how do we want to manage our parks and how do we want to pay for our parks, our excellent parks and recreation, because uh, I see the both together. Um, and I'm looking forward to that discussion and, and a really broad and deep community uh, conversation about it. Thank you, Bob. Eric. Thank you. I was no and no measures and back. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for teaching us that trick. <laughs> I was no and no on the measures and I am for fully funding parks. I know that my own business went through a big shakeup the last couple years, and we had to um, go without for a while, we had to contract, we had to um, re-budget, 
I'll just say that the income for the city of Ashland has, has taken a, a similar ride these last couple of years, and I understand that the income um, available money to play with, if you will, to work with, is, is lower <coughs> than we would like and to fully fund everything, all of our social services, uh, you know, fire, police, as, as well as parks. So we as a community are going to have to make some decisions uh, in this budget cycle on what we're prioritizing. I would, I would love to see parks fully funded by any, any measure or means possible. So anything that's on the table, um, I think, you know, that we can financially responsibly uh, pursue is, is what we should do, whether that's food and beverage tax going all to parks, whether it's working towards a new districting, where, you know, I, I think that it's, it's a very pillar of our community. And as, as, as a business owner and, uh, a, and a trails advocate, I see parks and recreation having this um, a unique, unique new opportunity <laughs> to, um, to, to marry trails and economic development in our community. And, and there's, there's lots of efforts that, are, that are, people have um, of, of parks and a wish list, if you will. And, and that's mine. And you know, in addition to all the great things we're doing right now, how, how are we going to continue? How are we going to continue to um, make progress on these efforts in, unless we can figure out a way to fully fund parks? So, yeah. thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. All right. Next question. So many employees of Ashland businesses cannot afford to live and work in Ashland. We need more affordable rental housing for people who work in our community. During your campaign, each of you offered solutions to address this issue. Now that you serve on the city council, can you tell us what you think the city can do to expedite the availability of affordable rentals? Eric, I'm gonna start with you. I don't know how I turned this off Get three times last time. It's like, I feel like a gavel judge in here. Um, well, if, uh, if you were, you're reading the news or you're watching the January 3rd council meeting, we had a planning commission decision challenged and that we overturned that I thought was a good example of, of city inter intervention. The planning commission did a great job of, of shepherding a project up to a certain point and we ran um, into a challenge and then the city council moved that project ahead with some with some changes I think that we're in interesting times by luck and ha happenstance there are several um, affordable housing and rental developments in the queue and the city can help get them through so that's great um, but moving forward the um, commissions and the bodies that are that are bringing these projects uh, up and, and into planning um, need better support and I think that there's more that the city can do to lower the bar to entry and, and I hope to be a part of those um, discussions and decisions. Great, thank you. Bob, how about if you go? Great, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, it's a difficult problem. Um, we've got a limited uh, land in the city and uh, so and there's a lot of people that um, want to, to to live here um, so how so land prices go up and um, so I see we're seeing the results of, of many years of, of, of that um, I'm pretty optimistic about what we're going to be able to do over the next uh, couple of years really I was um, I sat for the last nine months I guess on as an, on the housing production strategy advisory committee and we just had our, the last meeting. I was an observer this last time since I'm now on the council. Um, the, just yesterday or the day before, Wednesday. And um, so they're getting ready to send that to now the Housing and Human Services Advisory Committee and the Planning Commission. Then it's going to get make its way to the council. And that's a state mandated uh, strategy for each city of our size to really put you know pen to paper and commit to what we're going to be doing over the next eight years with very concrete plans and policy changes. And there's a whole bunch of things in there that the council will have to, to discuss and deliberate over. So um, watch for that. Uh, 
I, I think that'll be pretty pretty exciting uh, opportunities, really, for, for a lot of ways. I'd also like to throw a couple of other things into the mix, though. Uh, transportation is also part of the challenge. Um, I, um, and Tanya mentioned about the, the cost of commuting. Uh, some of our city workers live in Ashland, some live outside of Ashland. If they have to drive and the price of gasoline was going up, uh, you know, having a bus service that is convenient and can go to later in the evening when people have to get home if they're working in some of our city businesses is important. The uh, Ashland Connector, I'd like to see the Ashland Connector come back. And then I'd also like to have a shout out for uh, a lot of things that we can do and there are federal and state resources for energy efficiency that can reduce people's uh, utility bills at the same time that we're reducing our uh, uh, pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. Ms. Tanya. Thank you. So <clears throat> affordable housing is a big problem here as you mentioned in the question around our economy but it's also about our social fabric. What Ashland makes us special is that we have a variety of people who can live here, and as we continually price people out, that diversity is lower. We also have other goals around diversity that are related to people being able to afford to live here. It's frustrating how long it takes in government to make these kinds of things happen, and our staff is frustrated too. It's just part of the nature of the game, but we do have some great things in place. The housing production strategy is a very important part of this. It'll be our job on the council to keep moving those strategies forward that we identify in the spring through that process. Uh, but there are some other things that are coming together too. The state recently uh, went through its climate uh, friendly and equitable communities rulemaking process and that's created more flexibility for housing and zoning and what you can build around as long as it's near a bus line. So there are things to leverage there. The governor has declared a state of emergency around homelessness and of course part of dealing with homelessness is creating affordable housing. Uh, the HUD, um, housing and urban development at the federal level is just getting a big plug of money through the Inflation Reduction Act. So we are at a key time for positioning projects here in Ashland, for funding that is sort of once in a generation potentially funding, but also connecting the dots between some of the opportunities that we have. So we have some surplus property at the at, in Ashland. And last year or the year before, we, we instructed staff to give us ideas about how that can be leveraged towards some of these other goals. So, so we do have some land. There are conversations happening about how do we bring these elements, these new resources together in ways that create modest, affordable housing throughout Ashland. So that it's, it's hitting in all neighborhoods and we're continuing to move down that space of diverse housing. Great, thank you. Okay, so you heard about our uh, big ideas that we're sponsoring, our big ideas program that we're sponsoring through the library. Um, our last discussion was on adult homelessness earlier this month with Representative Pam Marsh and Diane DeReese, an ORA board member. We've heard about the need for safe parking programs for unhoused people. And for those of you who don't know what safe parking means, it's the authorized use at night of a parking lot or a garage for people who live in their cars. So my question is, how can the city utilize the city-owned Hargadeen Garage for safe parking program at nights, especially with the potential for conflicts with business use of the garage? Um, so Tanya, I'm gonna start with you. Alrighty. Um, so one of the things that I was the most proud of our staff for during the pandemic was addressing homeless issues. And we did this in a couple of parks where we had um, safe parking programs and, and you know, kind of worked through the growing pains of figuring out how to do that in a, in a good way <laughs> for both the people who make use of it and also for the community. And, and there, certainly there were some bumps in the road there, but we've got some experience I think to build on over at the Hargadine Garage. Um, we do, we would in any sort of process like this, it would be imperative for us to understand the use of that garage and how it's being used in terms of our local economy and then to build a program around that so that we are not negatively impacting our local businesses but we're also meeting the needs of the people who have, a, who need a, a place to sleep safely. The other thing though for us to keep in mind, I think it, always when we're looking at these temporary solutions is that we need to think of them as temporary solutions, as a way to make a really bad situation somewhat more tolerable for a short period of time because people should not be living in their cars. 
And so as part of a larger structure, structural change and, and housing production strategy and all of that, this makes sense, but I would want to just make sure that we don't think of it as a, a solution in and of itself. Thank you. Bob, how about you? Yeah, I, I would echo what Todd just said about that. It's, uh, it's the best of a, of a bad situation is making it safer. Um, I, um, so before the pandemic, when I was a volunteer at the Ora Community Resource Center, uh, Ora actually ran or facilitated a program with a number of churches that had safe parking in their parking lots. Uh, so, and Ora took on the responsibility of vetting the, uh, the, the individuals who were going to be there. The churches put up, uh, had a, uh, a porta potty uh, with a wash basin um, uh, there, and, um, and then uh, and probably maybe the city had a role as well. I don't remember at that time to, for, for cleaning, or maybe it was just the churches that did it. So it can work. It is, uh, it is a temporary solution. Uh, I don't know uh, about the Hargating, uh, Hargating uh, Garage uh, proposal. I'm sorry I missed uh, Pam's and, and Diane's uh, talk at the, at the library. It sounds like it was a really good, a good talk. Uh, and, uh, and I'll have to circle back with them and, and see what, they're, what, what other things they were, they were thinking about um, with that. But I think that's really, um, that's really all I, I have to say at this point. We, we do need to make sure that we're helping people to make the best of a bad situation. Um, that we, we, have, we need to bring, you know, we're talking about the all weather shelter, the extreme weather shelter. Uh, we had a discussion of that last time and looking for solutions on that as well. Again, very, very temporary uh, solution for people. And then um, we have resources in the community for uh, emergency housing that's a little bit long term while people get stabilized. And I mentioned over the opportunities for helping residents of Ashland now in the Super 8 Motel on the south side of town. Um, so I'll start to stop there. Great, thank you. Eric. Well, thank you both. Uh, I, I don't have a lot to add to the, situa uh, to the conversation. I did uh, try to do some research and Google more about the Hargan parking lot in particular. I, I don't, I don't, I wasn't there for that presentation, and I, I now I wish I was, because uh, I can't really speak to it. But as as a business person, um, I'm I'm challenged by that particular location, trying to think of how that would um, feel. Uh, welcoming and safe to somebody in their vehicle as well as visitors coming and going and and businesses uh, it seems as though it's our responsibility to provide safe parking as needed and and it seems humane to also uh, have it in an environment that is uh, conducive to you know fam, fam temporary living for families um, to have bathrooms uh, water close by and however we need to regulate that to make it to make it work and safe for the community um, I'm, I'm i'm open to but the housing crisis is real and our houseless community is growing it's a it's a large issue and i know that it's something that all communities are grappling with but especially ashland it's it's a very livable visitable um close to i-5 you know mild climate place to be and I, I don't expect that um, the economic situation is going to change for folks re seeking safe parking and we should make accommodations as best we can it's an interesting problem okay so as you know ashland's been impacted by climate change through wildfires drought summer smoke all sorts of other things the city has reacted by adopting programs such as uh, rebates for purchasing electric cars, the lawn replacement program to save water, and rebates for heat pumps to get away from the use of natural gas. So what will you, as city leaders, offer to incentivize Ashland citizens to address and reduce the impacts of climate change on city residents? Well, I'm going to start with you. Great. This is, uh... It's something I've worked a lot on in the last few years, and uh, we're actually in a very happy place that there are so many resources now for rebates and tax credits, depending on your income, for improving the, your, uh, your, the energy efficiency and reduce greenhouse gas emissions of your, your home. And that also reduces, uh, improves our resilience, people's resilience to the impacts of climate change. We, when you've got better, uh, safe place to be, 
indoors uh, in the smoky in smoky uh, days in the summer when it's uh, extreme temperatures. Uh, that's that's resilience to, to climate change as well. The big challenge um, it for, is for people with, with lower incomes to take advantage of those rebates and tax credits. Um, so what we really need is a way to expand, and I worked uh, as part of the Climate Policy Commission a, a year and a half ago in putting together a proposal that the City Council approved back then to apply for a 20-year, $10 million zero interest loan from the United States Department of Agriculture that would fund our existing on-bill financing. Many people probably don't even know that Ashland Electric, our utility, offers a zero, zero interest loan um, for these, some of these uh, improvements, which is really important for people that don't have the money to put down and then get rebated so they can spread out the payments uh, at very low interest, zero interest in that case, over five years. This loan from the USDA would extend it out over 10 years, making it even more um, Palette will make it actually uh, get people to pay the, the cost of the improvements uh, and the gap is really what we're talking about here because you can stack that with other kinds of rebates that are available. So that's those kinds of things are super important for making sure that everybody, the whole community, can participate in uh, in some of these uh, great uh, programs and, and solutions. Great news, Tanya. Thank you. Um, so the city of Ashland has done a lot of really good work on climate through our climate and energy action plan. Some of that work, though, has it has been hampered by COVID and by um, you know staff positions being uh, being open. But we have recently hired for our new climate policy analyst, and we'll be getting our, our committee up and running again to support the work of the council. Um, a couple of things, you know, when we think about climate. There really are three things we need to be doing. We need to be uh, making ourselves more energy efficient. We need to be moving from natural gas over to electricity, and we need to be making sure that that electricity is coming from sustainable sources and it's renewable. And the city has a number of programs in place. The USDA program that Bob mentioned is going to be a really key part of that and, and making sure that that goes through. Um, but there are also a, a lot of incentives now coming through the Inflation Reduction Act. So part of what our job is going to be in this new year, in these next couple of years, is to be to help our residents understand those incentives and help connect them to those as opposed to finding within our own budget um, additional incentives. So we need to see how far we can get with those programs that are coming on. Um, but we've done really good work there. And the, the other piece, though, is for us to be thinking about adaptation. And that's really where the fire risk reduction piece comes in, because the very best way we can protect ourselves is by doing our own work around our homes and yards. We have a $3 million FEMA grant that is helping us with the thousand or so most uh, at-risk uh, buildings and, and homes in our in our community, helping them get uh, reduce their fire risk. But we need to address that for all of our existing housing if we're all going to move ourselves to a higher level of safety. So that's the other thing that the city needs to be figuring out is how can we help individual residents do the work they need to do. There's many programs in place already, but we need to take them, figure out how to take them up a notch, a significant notch. Thank you. That's great, Eric. Thank you. Well, as a solar contractor, I'm going to put solar <laughs> I'm not here to talk about that. Um, the, the emphasis in the renewable energy industry right now was solar for everyone. Early adopters got us off and running, and now what do we do to get, in the, to get solar and renewable energy in the hands of everybody? And, and I believe that, that the city has an opportunity to, to take that spirit um, Moving forward, you know, we have we have great policy. We have we really have cutting edge policy with our net metering and our virtual net metering laws. Um, but now with the monies from the uh, Inflation Induction Inflation Reduction Act, it's possible for communities like Ashland to receive a large grant for a utility scale solar electric system that could actually lower the rates for our citizens and reduce our our footprint. And that's a unique opportunity that I think that we'll be able to take advantage of, but we need to do some planning around that first. Um, lots of planning going on um, to further reduce our carbon footprint around um, what it means to have a uh, sustainable community, you know, what it means to um, have better bike infrastructure for uh, bike transportation. There's a number of 
um, street and road projects coming up that potentially could have um, a huge impact on our community by providing protected bike lanes, for instance. Reducing the number of cars that are going through our city will reduce uh, pollution, car traffic, and might stimulate some more economic activity in our downtown area by shopping local and, and being more local. And also continuing to encourage um, the uh, subscription transportation um, and RVTD. That's all I have time for. Okay, thank you. All right, this is our last question from the public policy team, and then we'll open it up to audience questions. So our last question is, in our neighboring state of Washington, there have been recent examples of violence against city utilities, which have caused large-scale power outages in cities like Tacoma. So the city of Ashland offers electric, water, stormwater, and other utilities. As city councilors, how can the city increase protection and resilience of its utilities from vandalism, wildfire, and weather extremes? So, how about if you start, Bob? Well, um, the, I, it's a, it's a big question. I was, and when I heard, actually, it started in Virginia. I saw the news and it started in Virginia uh, maybe a month and a half ago. And just, whoa, that didn't, I didn't see that coming. Uh, and then it started happening in, I think, in Washington, but also in Idaho, maybe, too. Um, maybe even in Eastern Oregon, I haven't, I haven't, I'm not sure. So, yeah, I, um, that is something we absolutely have to, to, to take care of. And, and um, I, you know, I'm, We've got our local police force. We've got. We have to take um, action to action to make sure that we're protecting and, uh, and surveilling around the the uh, places. We've got a couple of substations um, against that sort of violence. Um, I don't really know, to be honest, how much we can uh, really do on that. And uh, I, I, I think it's something that I'd like to follow up on. It's certainly not something that I think we would want to talk about the details of. And. In, in public, because that's something that needs to be done, you know, by the professionals uh, on that. Uh, on the other aspects of resilience, though, with our, you know, our water, we our, our water treatment plant currently up uh, uh, just below Reader Reservoir um, is vulnerable um, to um, to wildfire and uh, then uh, mudslides if uh, if this hillside were to be denuded. So the city is, uh, I think, in the final stages of preparing for. Um, uh, beginning construction uh, on a new water treatment plant that would be in a much safer environment and that would also then have greater resilience um, in case of a uh, kind of tra transmission lines because it will have access to local solar uh, in that location. Uh, it's apparently a very good solar resource uh, up, up there where the new water treatment plant will be located. Um, so I think those are those are some of the, the, the principal uh, issues. We have. There's also we have to make sure that our water wastewater treatment plant. We had a fire that started just close to the wastewater treatment plant uh, just a couple of years ago. That thing will all remember. Okay, thank you. Hey, Eric, you're up. <coughs> okay. Well, I know that when we look at the utility sector, we are um, moving towards a new electric master plan, which will bring a lot of pieces of, of this together. Uh, the battery resiliency as well as uh, solar microgrid and, and all of those you know, SWOT analysis information that goes into that planning, I think as it has a new lens. I don't know if this is you know the eco-terrorist lens, but, there, but there's, there, there's lots of different risks um, and and um, ways to minimize those risks, uh, but redundancy being the biggest one. I, I love that our waste, uh, our our fresh water treatment plant is looking for, at, at a new location. It very, it, it's very um, precarious up there in the canyon, and uh, having it out more in the open, uh, backed up with solar and battery, just makes absolute sense. The, the current facility is end of life. And then the, the other redundancy on our water that we have now is um, plugging into the tap system, which gives us additional water resources. And um, moving too quickly, I believe, to, um, and, and 
anticipated threats might diminish what we can do. So I, I like that there's serious planning going around this now and that we can implement it with uh, future projects. Great, thank you, Tony. Thank you. Uh, so this is a, a very a newly emerging threat in terms of physical attacks on, on utilities. The other thing we need to be looking at is uh, cyber attacks because our, our utility systems are very, you know, are high tech, they, 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 have, they run on computers and electronics and that sort of thing that also can be vulnerable. We have recently restructured our IT system so that we can you know, have a position that's really focused on dealing with the cyber piece, and so I think that will be part of what, how we carry that over to the utilities. Um, but one of the things that we have to do is to just really think about um, what, what, where is that resilience, and how do we do that? And some of what we've been looking at is how do we make sure that we have resilient energy for our essential services, for our different utility structures, um, for our fire stations and our police department, that sort of thing. We're installing a, a solar system over at the, at the Civic Center. But those microgrid technologies can also disrupt those efforts at vandalism. Because if you can maintain certain areas, certain high you know, essential service areas, even with a general uh, maybe attack on a, on a utility, on an electric utility, then that helps us build that resilience. Um, the other thing I would just say is that we are very well networked. So because we're very lucky that we run our own electric utility. There are communities across the country trying to get their hands back on their electrical systems, and it's really hard. We, we, don't, we have our own electric utility, and we are networked with other, other communities that do across the Northwest. And so they are on this. They are studying what's happening in these other communities where these attacks are happening, and they are they are working through thinking about what does that mean for Ashland. And so the way forward is to really work with our, our expert staff to understand the risk and then to figure out what's the appropriate investments to make in addressing it. Thank you. Okay, so that's our public policy questions. All right, now, now I've got questions from Okay. Not typed up, so I gotta read this. Okay. Um, SOU registration is shrinking. OSF offerings are shrinking. How will Ashland support each entities, such entities, which are drivers of our financial stability? Eric, how about if you start that one? Well, thank you. Uh, I certainly, I've been reading the news like many of you have, uh, President, President Bailey's uh, efforts over there at the, at the university and, and all of the, the efforts uh, at, at Shakespeare with the new executive director. Um, the landscape has been changing for, se for several years and I'm glad in communications I receive to know that that leadership is on this and that they are working this as a new problem because certainly our economy um, it is one uh, what, and you know there's there's others missing from this list of course um, there's the hospital there's um, there's the Mount Ashland there, you know, there, the list the list goes on and on but my hope is that we all recognize that the times they are changing and that we have smart people in the room and with better communication I think we can we can build some bridges and, and ease the discomfort of these changes and these changes are a unique opportunity to make our community stronger and better so I believe that the city it, our responsibility is, is is being the hub of, of these communications and to bring people together and put resources into making sure that our economy is strong, our university is vibrant, and that our Shakespeare Festival thrives. Uh, and, and, and it's all going to be different. So we may have to give up some things to get some things here. But as a community, one of the, one of the great things we can do is come together on Monday at the town hall and talk about these things. Let's not, let's not be scared in a silo. The change can be scary. Let's, let's all do it together. All right, Eric, thank you. Uh, Tony, will you go next? Sure. Um, 
To follow on behind Eric, we are in a time of incredible change. It is coming faster than I think um, we are used to seeing, and it is scary. And with our, our primary institutions in town, there, uh, there is a lot of change. Um, one of the things that, to know is that our, our city administration, our city manager, is in close conversation with these different entities. So, so there is a sort of a staff-to-staff -staff, uh, conversation that's happening. In, in the, the moving forward, I guess, there will be things that are uniquely the city's role. And so that's what we need to be looking at, is what are the things that OSF needs, that SOU needs, that are uniquely within our wheelhouse to offer and to help with, and to focus on those pieces as part of a larger plan to build economic resilience to help these entities move into their new way of being, whatever that's going to be that, that ad adapts to these local circumstances. Um, Eric actually came up, he brought forward an idea at one of our very, our first two meetings of the year of um, potentially connecting an individual counselor as a liaison to some of these organizations so that they also have a connection to the, the uh, council body. And we haven't finished talking that through to think about what, what that would look like, but there, there was general support on the council as this would be another way to provide support and a direct link to the city. So I'm looking forward to taking that conversation back up again uh, because we are, the way we get through a time of this kind of change is by staying closely coordinated with each other as these changes happen. Good, thank you, Bob. Yeah, I guess uh, I'd be in, uh, reiterate, I think, the importance of uh, staying in close contact, communicating, and trying to uh, identify shared opportunities that, that will inevitably come as uh, people are looking, as organizations are looking for uh, adjusting. Um, that does offer uh, opportunities to share resources, to share facilities, to share different kinds of, uh, uh, of tasks. Uh, so communication is going to be key on that, and making sure that we have the, the people in place uh, on all sides that uh, have the trust um, all around to be able to have those conversations with, which can be very tense uh, as, as anyone that's going through these kinds of things knows. The other things that I would just add, add to the table from the perspective of the city of Ashland that we can bring is making sure that we're taking advantage of our uh, role within the broader uh, Rogue Valley. Uh, we are not just a, we are not an island. <laughs> We certainly have uh, economic linkages and planning linkages and facilities linkages all, all you know, down the highway through Talent and Phoenix and Medford and, and, and beyond. Uh, transportation is going to be important, making sure that people know about what, the, what there is available here in Ashton. The diversity of our economic offering and our, and our, and our businesses is going to be key. I think our Chamber of Commerce does a, a good job with their Travel Ashton. That's on tourism. We also need to uh, uh, take advantage of getting the word out to, with other reasons that uh, businesses can locate here because diversification is certainly going to be uh, uh, a key part of how we all go, go forward. It's going to strengthen everybody. Okay, good, thank you. So that question was about what you as city can do. This next question is about what can we as citizens do to support economic development needed to compensate for potentially decreased tourism for at least a while. So, um, Tony, why don't you start? Shop local. <laughs> One of the things that we need to do is to um, to support the, the businesses that are already here, and um, and and also to be thinking about you know for the, for SAU in particular, what is it like for a student to go to school here, right? And wh where do we interact with young people in our lives, in our businesses, in the work that we do out in the community? Is there a way for us to help them feel more like they're part of the community, more welcome? Um, to where that experience of going to school here is something that they're excited about. Um, and I think, you know, it's not that, that they aren't excited, but this is the place, this is the place at the margin where we can, can strengthen that. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's really the, the big piece of it is um, seeing what kind of initiatives are coming out how can we support them um, as a city? And I think that's part of the city's role too, is to be able to communicate what can the what can citizens do to help with the pathway once they're once they're more clear about what that pathway actually is. So um, that's that's what I'm looking forward to seeing is is 
those details coming out about what it is because that, that helps us as a city but then it also helps the community know how to swing in behind those efforts great thank you how about you eric what can we do i love deleting with shop local <laughs> uh, as a small business person i love owning and operating a business in ashland how do we get more businesses to ashland what is the what does the future of business look like? What does the future of small business look like, and how do we plan and prepare for that? We don't have the answers to these questions, um, but we have we have some idea, and and I believe that what what we're what we're doing in in planning our community will help strengthen small business. Um, but as our offerings change, for instance, uh, if uh, if our summer schedule from Oregon Shakespeare's Festival is, is much less than it has been in, in years past, we know that people come to Ashland for other reasons. For instance, the mountain biking community has really boomed in the last several years, and Ashland has always had great trails. Hikers, walkers, runners, bikers, adaptive, um, equestrian people. Uh, there's a lot of stakeholders that enjoy our trails. Just recently, in the last couple of years, we've seen more travel destination mountain bikers to our community. And this is just one idea. But I think that, you know, really developing our, our trail system and our infrastructure in town to support people coming here for that one particular activity could be a, a real boost to our local economy. And that's something that is near and dear to my heart, but it, it's just it's just one one thing that, that we can do. We also know that back to our park, beautiful park systems, um, we know that uh, we have a hard time with um, smoke and heat to a level that we've never had before. Well, how do we plan um, a, a recreation, parks and rec, to accommodate people here during our hot, smoky times? How do we, how do we keep our, our, our citizen base here? Because uh, it's difficult to exercise and be outside and uh, those are just a couple ideas. I love shop local. <laughs> well, I thought you were going to say something about um, you said before that um, people want to work in a cool place. I thought you were going to say people want to work, just want to shop in a cool place, want to live in a cool place. So, what can Ashland do to be to be cool to for that? Um, yeah, I don't. I think uh, Tanya and, and Eric, uh, you know, had a lot of you know put a lot on the table, I'm not sure that I have a, have a whole lot more to add. Uh, I do think the other aspect of our economy, though, is, um, just, I was just talking with a local realtor uh, this week, who was telling me that they're seeing, uh, they're seeing a lot more people moving to town with young children. Um, they're moving here, and I said, well, where are they working? Well, where do you think they're working? No. They're working in Atlanta, or they're working in San Francisco, and like, so they can have to, So the question is, well, what do they need? Um, because they're going, they are going to shop local. We want them to shop local. What are they going to shop for? What they, what kind of uh, services, other services, do they need? What, what's the, you know, how do we make sure that they, you know, stay here and are safe here um, as our climate changes and you know, our summers get hotter and. We have more people that are kind of leaving in the summers because of, they're trying to get away from the smoke. So really, kind of grappling with all of those things, we'll have more people that'll be that'll be part of the community to to, to think about that. Um, I, it's a big agenda. Uh, the economic development task ahead of us, I think, is going to be really a defining uh, question for the next uh, few years. That the, you know, um, we're all being we talked about what the city's role is. We all have a part of that. We are we are the city. So we have to just, uh, you know, no, I don't think anybody, any one of us has any of the answers. So it's really everybody participating in the conversation and trying to figure out what, what we can do uh, together to, to get through and to thrive. Okay, thank you. All right, this next question. The Coalition to Preserve Ashland's Mobile Home Parks has asked the council to rezone on three mobile home parks to protect them from closure. Is zoning the right way to protect this affordable housing option? So, Eric, you want to start? Thank you. I'm not a planning expert, not even a planning novice. <laughs> but I've, I've, I've met with some folks at 
the wing spread will blow them apart. And I was really taken into their community for that meeting and, and was able to walk around and, and, and be there. And I really got a sense for the community there. I absolutely support those efforts. I, I, I get it that that is a key component to affordable housing in Ashland. So I do support those efforts. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Um, yeah, I think the, um, our mobile home parks are uh, really um, a great, they offer a great community for the people that are living there, people that you know, do move into them. People, when I, in Wing Sprint, people told me that they went there, for, what they most valued was the community, is the community. Uh, and you can, it's really evident. Um, I think uh, zoning is, is part of the issue. For me, um, I'm focused on um, it's experiments, not more than experiments, it's actually a movement, I'd say, across the country for uh, resident-owned communities, for uh, mobile home parks to actually be owned by the people who are just renting the pad that their place is on. And, being, and that's the source of vulnerability because if the owner sells the property out from under them, you know, they, what are they gonna do with their mobile home? Are they gonna you know, pick it up and move it? It's mobile only in name. Um, so, uh, really finding ways to make financing available uh, so that people can take on that, that task and do it with a, the, the typical approach is either through a nonprofit uh, or what's more exciting to me, being somebody who's worked in cooperatives for uh, a long time, is you know a cooperative uh, approach where the where the community forms a cooperative and then they uh, and, and at the time when they can buy it because it's a, it does require a willing seller as well as a, an able buyer uh, being in a position to do that. It's a tough task, uh, but I'm really excited about working on that in the, in the coming years. Thank you. Yes, um, you know, the Alameda Fire really helped us understand the vulnerability of our mobile home parks. Because when the fire went through and the, those lands were cleared, all of a sudden the question was, are they going to be a mobile home park again? And often the, the financial uh, benefit does not push towards it being a mobile home park again. And that's the, the place that our mobile home parks sit right now is that there isn't anything that says that they can't decide to transition that mobile home park into market rate housing. And so to answer your question, yes, zoning has to be part of this because what that will do is it will take away that possibility for that big windfall moving into market rate housing. Alongside that, though, is that at some point, owners decide to sell. There isn't anything that can compel an owner to sell, but when they do decide to sell, we need to make sure that we've got those structures in place, because real estate moves quickly, to be able to get in there and, um, and protect the ability for the residents to move into that co-op ownership space. And it takes time. That's when, when you're not just coming in with an investor, that organization piece takes time. And I know uh, Representative Marsh has done a lot of really good work at the state level to figure out what kind of support systems would those be. Um, but absolutely, one of the very most important things that we can do on affordable housing is protecting that affordable housing that already exists. Right? And, and that, our, our mobile home communities are a huge part of that, and, and they do, they, they love their communities. I lived in, with my mom in a mobile home park for a while when I was growing up, and it, these are tight-knit communities in most places. They help each other, and we need to help them make sure that they can continue on and, and, and in a way where they, they have ownership of the land that they're on. Okay, thank you. It's a tricky one. Okay, this one. Um, the Latinx and other underrepresented people in the community can't do it. Have no representation on council. How can you make sure that these uh, voices are heard as recruitment reaches out there into groups? Does that make sense? How can how can how can we reach out to the Latinx and other representatives? Other underrepresented, other underrepresented people, uh, so we can maybe get maybe get those voices on council. What do you, what do you think, Tanya? I think we've done a lot of really good work in the last couple of years on social equity and racial justice. We certainly have a long way to go still, and uh, the events of last week um, and what happened with the uh, Say Their Names Memorial is a is a punctuated 
reminder that we are not done with the work that we need to do. But we, we have um, put in place the Social Equity and Racial Justice uh, Committee. And so I think the, one of the ways for us to um, be encouraging people into all levels of city government from the staff level through the committees and the council is by using the people um, and, and leveraging the networks of the people who have stepped forward to work on that committee on our behalf. Um, that's one of the ways to do it. It is, it is a tricky question of, of how do you get into communities when you don't have that relationship. So I think a big part of it is relationship building. A large part of it is engagement and we have not, the city has not been able to really engage the community in the way that we would like to for a couple of years now. We're making some structural changes to get um, staff to the, into that position where, where they can be more uh, outward facing and can do more of that engagement. So I think leveraging both of those things is going to be a really important part of, of getting more of that participation and more of that leadership into the city. Great, thank you, Bob. Yeah, I, I, but you, you, you referenced specifically the Latina community, and that, that's something that's really close to my heart, having worked for 30 years in Latin America. Um, not in any, in any way a part of the community, but I, I feel a real affinity. Uh, and, you know, it is a very small Latina community, um, and it's, it's, kind, it's often the, the, the BIPOC community that gets kind of forgotten when we talk about um, here in Ashland, anyway, um, be, uh, they kind of slip under the radar too much. Uh, so I don't, I don't know how best to bring them in. Um, I, I wish, for example, little things like the new Japanese garden has welcome signs in Japanese and French. You know, it would be nice to have it in Spanish as well. Um, I don't, you know, I get why it's in Japanese. I get why it's in French. It's the, you know, the principal donors. Uh, French heritage, that's, that's fine. But we can also add a Spanish welcome sign. A lot of the people that were building it were actually, you know, Latina workers, landscaping workers. So, I don't know, it just seems to me that there's, there's, there can be some small things like that. That's not really gonna change the overall um, picture, but little things to make people feel welcome, um, seen, um, and valued. I think is uh, what we have to do. It's not a systemic thing, but I think it's a responsibility that we all have as as, as people. Every time we we uh, we go out, and just really you know understanding uh, people who may not look just like us. And we look around the room here. It's a it's a very heavily you know white um, you know audience. Um, what can we do to uh, make sure that people feel like yes, I have a place in this room as well. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Our, our community is predominantly white, and yet, in the you know in in the community activities that, that my family participates in, there's a lot of brown in our community, and why does the city of Ashland seem to have? Uh, under representation uh, in, in the in the in the council body in the in the, the, the city participation I think that that's a great question and um, equity diversity and inclusion doesn't happen by accident it happens with intention and I think the the city getting behind our outreach and our communications is, is a great step and, and I've been and I've been watching this with a lot of pride so, although we've made some, some efforts and some advancement, it, by no means uh, is this something that we need to sit on our laurels about. We need to be proactive, especially with, with management teams, um, getting diversity training and, and really having um, a mechanism for, for change beyond uh, aspirations. Thank you, that's great. Okay, got two more questions for those of you who want to know that. Uh, the next one is, what is the average employee to manager ratio in city government and in the parks department? And Bob, how about if you start that? I, I, I don't, I guess the simple answer is I don't know exactly. Um, I think it's a complicated question because uh, I, I um, observed in other organizations 
trying to um, change the with other organizations that, that tried to uh, downsize in some sense. What it ended up doing is uh, having more managers and fewer staff because they're actually managing outsourced contracts and things. So it's, it sounds like a simple question uh, to which there would be a simple answer, but the simple answer may be a very misleading answer. Um, I, but I don't know. The answer is I really don't know what the um, manager to staff ratio in the parks department and the and the city at large. But I certainly will uh, will look up, look that up and think about that question because I I, I understand where the question is coming from. Um, and uh, but I think it is that you know it's also important um, to to keep in mind the jobs that people do <laughs> and and. Um, and what are the what's the level of skills and uh, and experience that, that are necessary to, to do those jobs? Or it's not uh, we don't have a city that's that's staffed with a lot of um, you know uh, low skill workers. So that brings more need for a, for a higher higher management. Okay, thank you, Eric. How about you? I don't have anything to add to that question. <laughs> Thanks for a good stab out of Bob. That was, that was really I'm sorry, I don't have anything to add. It's okay. Time pants. <laughs> There are important questions to ask around how we manage ourselves, especially in this time of great change. Are there structural things that we need to be doing differently or to be thinking about differently? Um, when we think about these kind of ratios though, too often what we're looking for is a simple answer that, said, that tells us if we have a problem or not. And unfortunately, that's a really difficult thing to get to because we are, we are much more complex that way. Ashland, uh, and in my mind, thankfully, runs its own utilities. We run our own water, wastewater, electric, AFN, we have a cemetery, we have an airport, um, we have a, a world-class park system, and when we think about what is the right way to manage that, the question that I want to ask is, is the management structure that we're using the most optimal structure that can deliver us what we want, right? So we don't have a huge staff that runs our water treatment facility because we don't need a huge staff, but they probably need a manager. Right? So if we think about it too simply, then, then we, we take ourselves in a direction that doesn't really help us. But the other part of that question I think is a good one. We just have to be careful around, um, around asking complex questions in too simple of a way. So that's what I would say, but I, I don't know what, the, um, what the, the ratio is in the parks department. <laughs> All right, it's a good question though. Okay, last question. This is this is interesting. It's what are you capitalized going to do to rein in the budget so that in line with Ashland's current income? Mm -hmm. Tommy, go ahead and start. Again. <laughs> I saw the eyes coming at me. Um, so so we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive, but stay with me. We will get back to the boat safely with this conversation around the budget. Um, we have, you know, you've heard talk about the structural shortfall, and it's important to understand what that looks like. So in, according to Oregon state law, our assessed value for our properties can only go up 3% a year. And what that means for us is that our tax base can only go up by 3% a year. When you hear conversations about the city's budget having a problem, it's in the general fund, which is primarily paid for by taxes. And the general fund funds fire, parks, police, planning, streets, and our primary administration. And so what happens over time is you, that 3% is really an inflationary number. And as long as all you have is inflation under 3% and you don't have new regulatory requirements and you don't have um, new, new um, uh, things like uh, unfunded PERS liabilities that suddenly you have a bill that you have to pay to the state, right? Then, you're, then, then you can see that that could be workable. But we have certain line items in our budget that have not jumped less than 3% for I don't even know how long, it's things like medical, um, you know, health care benefits. When was the last time we saw those drop, le jump less than 3%? We just saw what happened to inflation in this last year. That's going to cause a problem. 
Um, so we don't we don't have a, a, a an overspending issue so much as we have this constant vice that is working on us, and we're trying to maintain services at the level that Ashland wants them. Um, but we're we're dealing with this very real financial reality, and so that's. Um, what we will do, the question is, um, we will do our very best to maintain the service levels that Ashton wants as we deal with the um, reality of how much money we have to spend. That was a deep dive. Eric, you want to follow that? Thank you for that, Tanya. <laughs> we're having a town hall meeting on Monday, <laughs> and we're going to come together, and we're going to, we're going to look at this matrix of city services and we're going to put some dots on the board that represent a vote and, and we're going to digest this information but this is all coming from the citizens we're we're elected to represent you and we're going to do our best to listen to you and give guidance to staff and trust staff's recommendation in the budget process and I like the idea we're going to get all safely back on the boat when this is all done. But for now, the 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 journey is uh, is our is our path right now. So we're going to do our best to listen and um, and use our 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 votes to represent what is best for the citizens of Ashland. Thank you, Bob. You want to bring it home? <laughs> I'll bring the boat back to shore. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's, I guess it's important to recognize that this is not unique to Ashland. Uh, cities across the state are, are have been struggling with this for, you know, some years. Uh, primarily since the, 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 the rules, that, the laws that, um, that Tanya mentioned uh, changed back in the 90s, and I talked about the, the abandonment of the park levy. Uh, other cities have, have created districts, special districts, in order to try to escape from some of these, the, the, you know, the property tax rules. Um, you know, that has the effect of costing people more, uh, and I, any, to the extent that anyone would consider doing that, or that we would consider doing that, I would want to make sure that we're protecting the most, uh, the lowest income members of our community from any kinds of, uh, of rises like that. We, you know, we end up having the, the effect of that um, property tax cap is highly regressive that, that our property taxes are, are capped so that the people that have a million dollar house pay property taxes on half a million because the maximum assessed value now is only half a million roughly um, so that's a structural problem when we talk about a structural deficit uh, it's because we've got a structural problem we've got to find our ways within the Within the capacities uh, that are given to us by by the state, and we don't have a lot of uh, room to maneuver, so it will come down over this next period to choosing priorities, being carefully thinking things through, you know, looking at the you know looking at the, the tools that we've got at, at hand to try to match um, the the resources that we have to the kinds of services and. Uh, high quality that, that, we're, that we're looking for. One way, to, one way to solve the problem is just to slash quality, and I don't think that's what anybody wants to, uh, as well. So we're gonna, it's really going to have to be a, an involved community uh, conversation. Um, I guess I'll leave it there for now. All right, thank you. Yeah, that's the last word, I guess. <laughs> I'll leave it there for now. So I feel like we're in very thoughtful hands, and I, I want to thank you all for being a part of this, and I especially want to thank you all for joining us. I um, have a couple of announcements. Eric mentioned, as we've mentioned before, we've got the town hall meeting at the Armory at 5.30 on Monday night, okay? Uh, we also have our big ideas, our next big ideas meeting at the library, 4 to 5.30 on Tuesday, February 7th. And that will be past, present, and future of public broadcasting. And um, if you didn't get your questions answered, because we, we run out of time, please bring them to the town hall and ask and ask them there. Yeah, I, there will be a Q and A, right? It, it, there's a more of a it's more of a um, participatory a, a table participatory okay. kind of world cafe kind of okay. structure. All right. Well, so you heard it from 
for the captain the, of the ship, getting us in, getting us in, he was assuring us that we're going to get to the shore. Uh, anyway, thank you, thank you all for coming, and thank you all for coming.